In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with one of the legends of copywriting, Ted Nicholas, who's produced over $7.9 billion in sales in his own company and his clients' companies. He talks about what worked, what didn't work, his process for copywriting. Listen at the end what I challenge him to. He also comes up on the spot with one of the titles for this interview. That and much more coming up now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders about big lessons and challenges in life and business. Today, I'm especially excited to have Ted Nicholas. Ted Nicholas has produced over $7.9 billion in sales in his own companies and his clients' companies. He's owned 23 businesses, made millions in direct mail, and has written copy for more than 30 years. He's also the best-selling author 14 times over, including his book, Magic Words That Bring You Riches. Ted, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, your journey to success, and what worked, what didn't work. Um, I always like to include a fun fact about the guest. And fun fact about Ted is uh, he plays tennis every single day. And you said you have the world's largest collection of what? Of ties and hats. Very cool. And I, w- one other thing that we didn't talk about is that one of my other hobbies, I have a lot of hobbies, one of my hobbies and Bethany's that we share, we love dancing, especially Greek dancing. You can see a sample of my Greek dancing if you just look at my website at www.tednicholas.com. I think when I first emailed you, that's exactly what I said. I said, I love your Greek dancing. <laughs> I think I did remember an email from you on that score. Yeah. I get a lot, a lot of feedback on that issue. I love that. People uh, don't expect that, you know? No, I love that t- is personal touch. And I wanted to find out from you, before we get into you know, some of the things that worked and didn't work, I wanted to hear about where you grew up and what influenced you early on. Sure. All those things contribute. After all, no other direct marketer or copywriter has ever produced anywhere near the sales that I have. And there must be a reason for it. It doesn't happen automatically, for sure, as you immediately have have sensed when you were studying my background. So I think your questions are very good about my background and what helped and what didn't help and maybe what motivated me in a kind of an indirect way. Well, you know, my father was a fairly successful small businessman who owned a restaurant. And I started working in the restaurant. And since uh, at least my father never saw the, uh, the laws about uh, child labor applying to me. So when I was 11 and 12, I was working a lot of hours during the summer. It was a summer business. And my father worked many hours all summer. And I did too. And that helped me a lot in the sense that I learned how to work. Whereas most people these days, especially, but it was always the case, really don't know very much about work. They they don't want to work or they're looking for shortcuts and there really aren't any, but they, they think there are and they're looking for kind of an easy way out. Just doesn't happen. So I wanted to be successful, but my father on the, at the same time, what he, thought of as success for me was he wanted me to be a pharmacist of all things. And I used to ask him, why do you want me to be a pharmacist? I don't like messing around with chemicals and stuff. I mean, why would you want me to be? He said, because people will call you doctor and they'll always respect you and you'll always have a job. See, my father saw the life of an entrepreneur the way he had was so difficult. It was his way of trying to ward off all the pain that I would eventually suffer. But I wanted to suffer the pain. I wanted to be in my own business. I wanted to be much bigger than my father was. And so that motivated me, but in a kind of an indirect way. I wanted to show my father 
and others that doubted me that I was going to be successful on my own. So that was a very big influence on me. Also, a couple of other big influences. My uncle Frank was my father's brother, somewhat younger than my father. And my father helped him get started in business. And he was a very, to my mind, a more complete kind of an entrepreneur. My father was a workaholic, but my uncle Frank worked hard, but he had a boat and he was the golf champion of his golf club. And I just admired him. He had a very warm personality. He was very uh, communicative with all his employees, his customers. And I thought he's a real inspiration for me in his own way. I mean, he didn't know he was in What kind of business did he have? He had, a re- he had four restaurants. Okay. What kind of restaurants was, were they? They were upscale restaurants, dinner restaurants in the New Jersey Shore area. In fact, they're still operating, although my, my uncle is no longer with us. The restaurants are still operating. And my aunt is operating one of them. And uh, he basically sold the others, or the estate sold the others. So he was a very big influence. Then I had another, we called him uncle, but I'm not sure how, where the blood connection was. Uncle Getzos, G-E-T-S-O-S. He was a furrier in New York, and he used to kid around with me all the, he, he loved to wrestle. When I was a kid, I used to just rough and tumble and like to wrestle. And he liked to wrestle with me on the beach. And of course, he was much stronger, much bigger than I was. But it was like good exercise, a lot of fun. And he used to say, you know, I've learned how to be successful in business. I go, well, what is that, Uncle gets us? What makes you successful? He would say, well, you know, I work on 1%. I buy something for $1 and I sell it for $2. 1%, he'd say. And so he would laugh. He thought that was really funny. And I finally got the joke after a few years. So he was a very big influence on me because he too was kind of a, he traveled a lot. He was like a world of gourmet. He knew a lot about food. He knew a lot about restaurants. And he was a big inspiration. But the biggest inspiration on my life was then, and still is now, are books. To my mind, the best way you can learn anything is through good books. The two best ways to learn, in fact, in my view, are through reading and through traveling. And so this is what I try to do as much of as possible. And I continue to read how-to books, books on marketing. I write, Of course, I have well over 100 books in my library on marketing. And I also, I, I basically spend, and I spend a lot of time traveling both for pleasure and for business. And I think they're two great ways to learn. What are some of your favorite books? My favorite books, (laughs) I have so many. I just finished kind of a re-entry into the life of uh, John Grisham. And I I like his books. I like his style. I like his writing style. And I've always been fascinated with the courts, with law, with constitutional law in particular. And to me, he's a great example of a fictional a writer who writes fiction you can learn a lot from. But I mean, there, I have so many favorite. My very favorite author is Ayn Rand, who I got to know personally, oh, wow. who wrote Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, We the Living. In fact, I was an, an investor in the movie We the Living that uh, ran in the States for several years. And so objectivism taught through her books is one of the great influences of my life. And another thing that people might find, a lot of people would find maybe unusual or they didn't know about me, I'm a libertarian. I basically believe in a limited government, very limited, and a small role of government, whereas the free market does almost everything else. So that would be another thing very few people would know about. What about, what's one of your favorite marketing books? Oh, boy, I have so many. Uh, I like David Ogilvie's book, Confessions of an Advertising Man, is a tremendous book. 
I like all the books by John Caples. I used to correspond with him when he was alive and he was with a big BBDNO, big advertising agency in New York. In fact, I once sent him one of my best ads for my book on forming a corporation, which was my first big bestseller. And I asked him, I told him, look, write an ad for me. I'll pay you anything you want. And he wrote back and said, I don't think I can improve your wow. best ad. I thought, boy, that's a So compliment. tell us about the best ad. Well, the best ad for me, I, it, for that particular book, was the first couple of ads that I wrote. I wrote an ad with a long title on it, which was the title of the book that everybody told me was too long. They said, oh, the book title's too long. I knew it wasn't too long, but I had written over 200 titles, whereas most authors write, write three, three uh, titles for a book, and they think that's a lot. So that particular uh, book was the best ad was the headline was the, was the really the the uh, title of the book and the title of any book is the headline for the book so any authors out there would be authors you've got to have a title for a nonfiction book that's a killer title don't do what most authors do spend two years on the book and 20 minutes on the title because you're going to die with that kind of a book, and most authors do die. With a, they come to my seminars and they tell me, my, I took, came out with this book and I look at the title, I look at the book, and I say, no wonder you died. You deserve to die. With all respect, I don't want to insult your book, yeah. but you really haven't spent enough time on the, on the headline, the title. And that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make. And I, boy, I have made every single one of them. But the good news is, if you come out with a wrong title, you can simply retitle the book, which I've done several times, and turn, turn losers into winners by having a really good title, which I didn't have when the book was first published. So what was the, so when you first came out with that, did you end up switching that initial title? What was the initial title and what did you end up switching to that made it more no, of a winner? The first the first book that I came out with, my, my first title was the winning title, How to Form Your Own Corporation Without a Lawyer for Under $50. That was a killer title because that tells you exactly what the book is about. So that was the killer. But for example, a book that I had a failed title was one of my books, which is about debt management. and. What I, my first title was How to Get Out If You're In Over Your Head. I thought that was a real cute title. And I had on the cover, my graphic designer and my company uh, created a, a uh, cover with a swimmer swimming to the top of a swimming pool with that title. And when I, the book came out, I could see that it wasn't selling at all. In fact, I sold three copies, one to my mother-in-law and two to my friends. Three books, and I thought this is this is a disaster. I'm coming out with a disaster, and I went into the local bookstore which I own, which one of my friends ran, and he displayed my books. And he was displaying the book. I couldn't find the book in the business section. He had it in the sports section because he thought it was a book about swimming, because of the title, because of the the graphics on the title. So I switched the title to how to get out of debt, which is what the book title, which was the book, that was what the book was about. And immediately I sold 60,000 copies wow. because that's what people want to do is get out of debt. In fact, that's one great lesson that I learned that I teach in my seminar. Don't be cute. Don't try to be funny. Don't do anything except describe exactly what your product is all about. Most product names, in my view, are disastrous and most products fail. And a big reason they fail is because the way the title, the, the product is described in the title, it deserves to fail because nobody knows what it's about. You've got to have a killer title for your product 
as well as a good headline for it right. in order to sell it. Yeah, I mean, there's one thing too with having a great headline is another in selling books. So once you have that killer headline, like you said, how do you sell tens of thousands of books? Well, you simply repeat a winning formula. It's not as complicated as it first appears. What I did was when, with my first book, I wrote an ad and ran it in the Wall Street Journal in the business classified section of the Eastern edition. It cost me $90. And when I ran that ad, I got about 350 replies. And I wrote my first sales letter and I got back in about 496, close to $500 in sales. And I thought, this is incredible. It's a good return. $90, yeah. almost $500 in sales. And I got the money up front before the book was printed. And I thought, all I'm going to do is run it in the English speaking world exactly the way I've already done it. And I'm going to make a fortune. And I, in the meantime, I had started several small businesses including a chain of candy and ice cream parlors of 30 candy and ice cream parlors that were highly successful. But I knew that this was going to be even more successful because it was a much lower food. It wasn't like the candy and ice cream business where you have a very high food cost. Close to half of the retail price is food cost. Whereas in the publishing business, people are not paying you for paper and ink. They're paying for the concept that's in the book. So you can sell a book for $100 and you may only have $5 in costs. I thought that's more my kind of business because people just are very willing to pay for helpful information. So that's basically how I learned that first lesson about what I needed to do to be successful. Yeah, so going back, Ted, to the early days, and you were talking about the ice cream parlors. Where did you get started? I got started in a little town called Bear, Delaware, which is a small town outside of Wilmington. And I had $800 in savings. And I started that first business with $96,000 in debts. And I figured that if I flopped, which was a very good possibility, I came close to it, then what did I have to lose? If I was honest with everybody, including my creditors, I simply get another job and start another business. Because one of the- How old were you my, at that time? I was 21 when I started. And wh what I could see is the most successful people that I admired in America had all failed many times, like F.W. Woolworth, Milton Hershey, all the people that I admired, most of the, Henry Ford, all the people that I admired failed many times and I figured if they could fail, why couldn't I fail? And if I, I would start over, if they could start over again, I'd start over again. So I wasn't afraid of failure, whereas I noticed that my friends were very afraid of failure. In fact, I noticed that when I was even in high school, I used to ask my close friends, I was on the basketball team and played different sports, I used to ask him, why don't you ask Susie out to the dance? And he'd say, I don't want to ask Susie because she might say no. I said, so what? She says no. It doesn't hurt you. There's a lot of other young women that are home on Saturday night. Where did I you mean, get that mentality from? Because like you said, not everyone thinks like that. Where I don't know exactly, but it just seemed to me I wanted to be popular with the young women. And I noticed that the most attractive until I happen to like beauty and brains. I like the combination. And the most attractive women were staying home on Saturday night when I would ask them to go out. 90% of them go to a dance. They would say, I'd be delighted to go to the dance. When they didn't go to the dance, they would say, you know, I would love to go, but I have a boyfriend in Atlantic City, you know, in some distant city. But, and I'd say, look, if you ever, I don't wish you any bad luck, but if you ever break up with that boyfriend, please let me know because I'd like to take you to a dance or a movie or something. And invariably, a few months later, they'd say, you know, I broke up with that fellow from <laughs> Atlantic City. I'd wind up, you know, having a chance to go out with a young woman. And I noticed my friends would rather sit at home rather than be rejected because I thought 
I thought, there's no big, you know, the, the big, one of the big lessons I learned, you know, come, coming along into the business world was, if you fail, nothing bad happens. Nothing bad happens. Nobody told me that. I thought, oh, you fail. You know, like if you're in school and you fail, I didn't fail any topics. I was fortunate. But if you do fail a topic, so what? You take the class over. Whereas, whereas a lot of parents teach their kids this lesson that if you fail, you not only fail the topic, but you failed as a human being. And when you fail as a human being, you can never get that back. And I think I'm thinking to myself, what a terrible message that is. Instead of you think you tr try, you do your best. I don't believe in just going out willy nilly without any effort. No, do the best you can. But if you fail, no big deal. You just do it over again. So with the and candy, I, let me ask you a question, Ted. With the candy and ice cream parlors, that first one, what made you start with candy and ice cream? Well, my father had a restaurant and he had a candy and ice cream department. And one of the things that I did growing up was work with the candy makers and the ice cream maker mm. and learn how to do that. And I was always fascinated. As a matter of fact, I had uh, patented several recipes in the candy business. Mm. I love the business. I love I loved it second best to the publishing business. I mean, I enjoyed it then. I enjoy it now. We go happen to go out like twice a day. We're like authorities on restaurants because we love restaurants and local people don't go out twice a day. We go out twice a day because I'm still writing all the time. I'm writing all the time. And when you're doing a lot of, I happen to be a very good cook because I had 30 restaurants. I know how to cook. My wife's a very good cook, but I'd rather spend my time on creative things like with writing than I would washing up, going shopping for ingredients and stuff that you have to do in order to cook. So we enjoy going to restaurants now as patrons. And in fact, several of my friends who publish information about gourmet food, they want me to review restaurants. And I said, look, I'm going to draw the line somewhere. I, I almost, and I'm not going to spend my leisure hours, part of them, writing copy for you for your business <laughs> when I would rather just go there and enjoy it. It was a good stuff. shot though. It was a good shot. I'm asking you. Yeah, it was a good shot. Yeah. What? So, so tell me how you started with that first one. What were some of the lessons? Because you built it up to 30, right? I built it up to 30 uh, stores. Well, basically, uh, I, as I mentioned, I started with almost no money, 800 bucks. I, I talked the landlord into a $50,000 property with no money down. Wow. I remember I paid 30874 the mortgage payment to Mr. Harry Kendall every month. Because, but it wasn't any great persuasion on my part. Several people had gone bankrupt in the world. It wasn't the hottest location in the world. So he was happy. I said, Mr. Kendall, I can't promise you I'm going to be successful, but I can promise you that I personally I'm going to, and I'm not a handy person, but I'm going to repaint your property. I'm going to spruce it up. If I fail, you're going to have an improved property. Like that, I guarantee it. He said, gee, that's, I said, think about it over the weekend. I know people don't approach you about it like this. Think about it over the weekend. And if you feel comfortable working with me, I don't think you have anything to lose because I'm going to put my effort in your property. And so that's how 50,000 of the 96,000 occurred. And I went to equipment people in the confectionery bin. And I said, look, you're sitting there with a warehouse full of equipment. These are used equipment, confectionery equipment, baking equipment. I am willing to take on your several of pieces of your equipment. If I succeed, I will pay you every month. I'll sign a contract right now. I'll pay you every month until the debt is paid. Well, you can imagine what a few of them told me. They said, no, nobody's ever a pro. We can't, we can't do business. And I said, if you can't do business like that, I understand you have the right to do business the way you want. But a couple of the people, including a company called the W.H. Smith Company in Philadelphia, they said, I will go along with you. So they went along. 
for most of the rest of the 96,000. And then my raw material suppliers, because I was going to make candy and ice cream, they put in the equipment and the, in the, the uh, materials in my property. In the event that I did succeed, I would pay them too. Otherwise, I said, we'll have a big candy party. We'll eat the candy. I mean, <laughs> they only had a couple, couple thousand dollars at risk. So that's how I built up this huge debt. But what happened was I hired a young woman. I noticed there were 40,000 cars a day. I got a count from the estate passing my place. And I reasoned that most of the people passing by were men, male drivers. And men tend to be interested in women and in cars. Well, I couldn't do much about cars, but I noticed one day, a couple of days later, a young, beautiful girl was competing in a roller skating uh, uh, competition. She finished one of the top finishes, and she was training about two miles away from my main all my my headquarters where I wasn't doing much business again I was only open a few days I, I contacted her and I said listen would you be willing to stand in front of my shop stirring a big copper kettle of chocolate and we'll make you I'll have a seamstress make you a very nice outfit with a chef's cap and you stir and we will go out there on a Saturday morning. She, I said, well, I'll pay you on an hourly basis. She said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. Young woman, make extra money. So we brought her out the first weekend we brought her out. We had a traffic jam in front of our place. Very, wasn't a very costly promotion. Wasn't costly at all. But the local newspaper came out that day and they did an article about this young entrepreneur, me, started this business, had this girl, you know, told a story, having all these homemade things, and you get free samples and all that. And when that ran, immediately the local population, a big percentage, started coming to my shop. So immediately I was successful in making big money. I was making big money. Here was a guy I had only worked on a few jobs, several jobs actually, and the difference between making like $200 a week and making $2,000 a week was huge. Big you know? difference, yeah. I was in my own business and I was having Especially when you're time. 21. Especially when I'm 21, exactly. So then I really repeated that same formula in shop number two, shop number three, shop number four, until I got... Then I had about 20 shops of my own. And I started franchising. So I franchised a dozen or so shops. And that's how I started expanding. And I could see a national chain coming along. I could see myself being in charge of a national chain. And when I was 29, I get this invitation, I couldn't believe it, from the White House. I thought somebody's pulling my leg in the White House. Uh, you know, I mean, I've never even been to the White House as a tourist. I mean, why would any of the white? So, but I thought, suppose it's real. I call the White House and I ask for, who do I talk with to find out I have this invitation? They said, oh, you have to talk with the social secretary of the president, which I did. And by God, it was authentic. It was authentic. And I was invited to the White House as one of 48 or 49, however many states there were at that time. And there were one person from each state was chosen as the entrepreneur of the year. Oh, wow. And I, and I finished at the top two, one of the top two when I was 29. I thought, this is pretty cool. Gave me a lot of publicity. But my real love, and this is where my life started turning around. My real love was writing letters to the editor. I loved writing letters to the editor and seeing my byline. And I thought if someday I could learn how to make money, make a living writing, that's what, that would be to me heaven on earth. Hmm. If the people would pay me to actually write things. I thought that was so cool. 
And so I put that kind of planted the seed. That's a big change my, from candy and ice cream to writing. It How is do you make a big that? Change. Yeah. It is a big change, but basically, basically, I just thought somehow I could make it. I believed that I could make it because I thought if I could write, if I could write letters to the editor and get past these hard-boiled editors in magazines and newspapers, I could certainly start my own publishing company because I'm going to make the decision as to what's published or not, not some editor. You know, I just thought I could do it. And so that's what I, I wrote my first book, How to Form Your Own Corporation Without a Lawyer for Under $50. And that was your first transition from the candy and ice cream parlors to, to writing? Right. But I did it night. I, I still ran the candy business. I call it the candy, the candy and ice cream business. And then I was writing, I was, uh, writing nights and weekends. But the rest of the time I was running the business, that business, because that was paying me a living. And I had a wife, four children. And so I had to make sure I provided for, for them. And so nine publishers turned me. I, I said, look, my name is Ted Nicholas. I've written this book. It's going to revolutionize the way people incorporate in America. There is no question about it. They're like me. Every entrepreneur is like me. They hate lawyers. Even lawyers hate lawyers. <laughs> and so my book is going to show you how to set up a company with tear out forms right in the book. You tear the forms out of the book. You send them to the Secretary of State, which I had the forms approved. In fact, they're still being used by the state now. The state asked me permission to use my forms because I had rewritten in a, them in a much simpler way. And so that's how I basically got started. And that was my first. But there was one other element that I didn't that I should mention. I knew that all what's called the registered agents that that incorporate people and set up an address for the, the companies that they basically are owned by lawyers servicing other lawyers. And I thought that's ridiculous. My clients don't care about lawyers. My clients care about their own company, just like I do. So I, I set up a company called the Company Corporation, which became the largest incorporating company in the world and still is. And I sold it in 1991 and became their marketing guru for a number of years. Now I have nothing to do with the company because they, the company was sold again. And when I sold the company, I had 125,000 roughly clients. And I and when I sold what, a few years later, it had 250,000 clients. Wow. Now it has well over 400,000 clients but by far the largest company of its kind in the world. So that was very, very important in my, in my development because it was a very profitable company because I had all those clients worldwide paying me $100 a year roughly forever. And when you have thousands of people paying you $100 a year, it adds up to a lot of money. <laughs> yes, it, it does. It adds up to millions. It adds up. So, that was sort of a big part of uh, my background. Tell me, I want to hear about how you went from the book to them actually, you know, you were doing the service for them every year. How did that come into play? Well, I did the book and I realized that they also needed an annual service from a registered agent company. I talked with a few registered agent companies. They were afraid to talk with me because in the state of Delaware, where I was operating at the time, the uh, lawyers all had gotten together and they had a mock trial. They were going to file. I was praying they would. I were going to have a mock trial to, to find the distribution of my book, the unauthorized practice of law. But I had done my homework and I knew that a fellow who'd written a book several years before about... Uh, about uh, estate planning, and he wrote the book, and the lawyers tried to stop him, and he filed a, 
a lawsuit in the Connecticut Supreme Court and he prevailed and he won. And I, th I knew that I was going to win if I ever had to go to court or I felt I was going to win. Right. And I thought if I if if they file a suit against me, I'll get all kinds of publicity because I noticed in doing a lot of radio and TV talk shows that even when I was on with the most uh, well-known lawyers in America, people were on my side because they considered me a consumer advocate right. where the lawyers are kind of defending their own. Yeah. Oh, you shouldn't cross the street unless you talk with a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera, right. which is nonsense, which is OK for some things, but not for everything. So, I, you know, I would get on the programs and I would say, look, I'm not an anti-lawyer person in spite of the titles of my books and in spite of my ads and all these things. I'm a person that thinks lawyers overcharge for some things. They don't overcharge for other things. And you've got to choose. You're, you're a consumer of services. You've got to choose what you, you do. And so this, is, this was my argument on the shows. And so I had a friend who was a constitutional lawyer. I played squash with him. I was playing squash at the time. And he was a great kind of Ned Carpenter, great constitutional lawyer. And he thought, hey, guys. He, he, he stood up. Of course, I wasn't invited to this meeting of lawyers. I mean, he was there, though, because he was a lawyer and constitutional expert. And he said, Nicholas is going to get all the publicity and we're going to get crucified because he's going to beat us in court. He said, you got to drop the suit. And they all listened to him and they dropped the suit. So they never did file. But my name was like, I was like controversial person in the state because no one, everybody else was dotting every I, talking to their lawyer. They they weren't doing anything to, you might say, be on the side of the consumer like I was. I thought, I'm the new kid on the block. If I try to do what these guys have been doing for a hundred years, I'm gonna, they're gonna kill me. I'm, go, I'm not gonna be successful. I'm only gonna be successful if I can be unique be an individual, do my own thing, and that's what I started doing. So when you're publishing the book and people are buying it, is there something in the book that says, go here for, for us to oh, do the service for you? Or how did that you make absolutely. that jump? Well, I had a unique way. I had like something like 11 companies that were competitors to me that I mentioned that they could go to if they wanted. Or they could go to my company, the company corporation. Well, what happened is... 99% came to my company. In other words, most authors won't put their, you might say, their competitors in right. their book. I put the competitors in the book because I reason that if I was writing this book that's going to save them all this money, why wouldn't they do business with me? My, my rates are lower. My service is faster. So that's what they started doing. And I I got the majority of the, of the business from the book. So see the book sold. The book is already now 2 million copies in print. No other book has ever sold anywhere close to that level. But what people don't realize, this is what I'm sure you'd be very interested in. The book has about 32,000 words in it. But I have written about 125 ads for the book. Each one of my ads is at least a thousand words. So that's 125,000 words. So I have written four times as many words to sell the book as the, they're in the book. That shows you where my, my head is. Whereas most authors, you know, they think uh, they go on a talk show and write one ad in it. You've got to be willing to go out there, man, and break your butt to sell books. You want to be a best-selling author, it's not going to happen by itself. A lot of them think it's going to happen. They're going to write a book and people are going to beat a path to their door. They read about the mousetrap when they were kids and the mousetrap is wrong. The mousetrap, that phrase is wrong like many phrases that you build a better mousetrap, people do not beat a path to your door. You've got to also write great copy. So what was the best when you went out and you wrote tons of ads to you know get people to buy the book? What was one of the best ads that you remember? The best ad of all 
was the one that's ripped off by everybody all over the world. I keep writing. I still write cease and desist letter. The headline is the ultimate tax shelter. The ultimate tax shelter. But ironically, it promises what I, in fact, I teach in my seminar, the hidden benefit. My best ads have not been what most gurus teach using the top benefit. My best ads uh, feature the hidden benefit. And the hidden benefit is something. Now, in my book, with the headline, The Ultimate Tax Shelter, there's not a word in the book about the ultimate tax shelter. Not a single word. The phrase is not in the book. But it's the reason that many entrepreneurs set up a small company because they're looking, they're dying from government regulations and red tape and they need every tax shelter they can get. So they set up a company to do it and they use my book because it's the cheapest way to do it. And so the, the, the ultimate tax shelter becomes a very big benefit, even though there's not a word in the book, but it's a byproduct of the book, if you see what I'm saying. And many of my ads have been exactly that. Now, for example, for one of my clients came to me and said, we've got this best-selling book in Germany and we're dying in the U.S. And the book is about public speaking. And I do a lot of public speaking. And so I'm very interested in the subject of public speaking. I read the book. It's a great book. And, but I, I saw the way they, I, I looked at the translations to English, to German, what they were trying to do in the States, and it was boring and dull. I said, You're, you'll never succeed with this copy. You're only going to succeed with this copy if I come up with a home run. So I come up with this headline that says, it says, how to get enthusiastic applause, even a standing ovation every time you speak. Now, every speaker is just like me. They don't want to leave the stage unless they get a standing ovation. And 99% of speakers speak their whole lives and never get one standing ovation. I, every time I speak, I get a standing ovation because I practice these principles. And so that's the headline, and I wrote the rest of the copy. Well, we come out with the ad in the States, and it's a killer, and it's the best thing they ever did. And it became, the book became a big bestseller. They're still using the copy, Georgetown Publishing. And so that's another example. There's not a word in the book about a standing ovation. But it's the reason people are getting up there, staying up, because if they only, only got a few smiles from the audience, they'd be happy, you know? Mm -hmm. Most people, a lot of doctors, they want to speak. They speak and they look at the audience and several people are asleep. Well, it's a very, it's a very, uh, you might say, a real put down. People are sleeping when, when you're speaking, you know. So anyway, that, that's another example of the hidden benefit that I use, that I teach other people at my seminars. And that I can only kind of touch the surface of it here. Right. But, but that's what I basically, one of the things that I teach, because the headline is so important. I mean, people come to me all the time and they say, Ted, will you take a look at our copy? I say, well, reluctantly, I will. I hate to look at copy because most of it is so bad. I mean, it's so incredibly bad. But I look at the copy. And the copy is, let's say, if I'm grading it, it's a C. But the headline is an F. The headline is an F. It fails. It just doesn't. It doesn't connect. It doesn't do anything. You've got to have great headlines. And so, if your headline is not great, you're gonna. You're not gonna succeed. I guarantee anybody listening to us today. I don't care what guru you're listening to. You're you're smoking your own dope if you think you're gonna succeed without a great headline. It's not possible. And I. That's the first thing I tell clients when they come to me. I said, look, I don't want to offend you. But you're asking me to evaluate your copy and what I can do. What I, and I, what I can do is if you want me to try to increase your sales by 10%, I can do that pretty easily because most people, 
with a few tweaks, I can increase it by 10%. But if you if you want me to go for a home run, I'm willing to do that. But if your home run is either going to be a huge, huge success or it's going to flop, what do you want me to do? They said, go for the home run. I mean, 99% want me to go for it. They don't want me to just tweak it a little bit. What's a, what are some of your techniques, Ted, for producing the best headlines? Well, first of all, some of my techniques are you write a lot of headlines. Again, and some of my, here, here is a couple of the secrets. When I'm doing copy, the first thing that I do, first element that I work on is the headline. Most copywriters and marketers and entrepreneurs write the body copy. And then as an afterthought, they write the headline. You are not going to succeed like this because the body copy has to follow the headline. The body copy has to, has to make the headline even more powerful. And so when I look at other people's copy, that's the first thing that I look at. Is, is, and so if you're writing it out of sequence, see, most people, when they write copy, they write the body copy first. Then they write, then they write the rest of the copy, then they write the bonus copy, then they write the testimonials. That's all wrong. What I do, I write the headline, number one. Number two, I write the order form. Most order forms in direct marketing copy, I don't care whether, whether um, who's doing it, whether Apple's doing it or whether some copywriter or some obscure copywriter is doing it. They basically have a boring order form. Boring order form turns people off. It's the most important reason you're contacting somebody. So I write the order form right after, right after the headline. And the reason for that is there's a couple of very strong reasons. Number one, a lot of times the order form gets separated from the rest of the copy and it's got to be strong enough to sell the product up without the sales letter. Yeah. And so my order forms, most order forms are ugly and boring. Mine are beautiful. They have samples of the, they have, they have people on, them. they have photos of the product. They're in color. They are so cool. They have the top two to three benefits from the body copy. They are really, really good. And the offer is, is, is punched out in the order form, is featured in the order form. So, and I never use two words in the order form, which most people use. Never use the word order because it reminds people they're spending money. And never use the word form because even if you're a CPA or accountant, you hate to fill out forms right. just as much as I do. So you don't use the words order form. Mine have like reservations. You have to have a headline. Reservation certificate, for example, is a popular one that I use. Yeah. And so, and so the order form, the sequence, in other words, of writing copy is critical. I've never heard anyone, maybe somebody does, or people, some people try to rip off my seminar, and so maybe somebody's teaching what they heard on tape or something, but I've never heard anyone talk about the sequence of writing copies critical. And so some of these guys that are out teaching the copy, they've never written a word of successful copy. Or some of these professors that are out there, they've never met a payroll. They've never written copy when your life depends on it, when your house depends on it, when your mortgage depends on it. You really better know what you're doing or you're going to lose it all. And a lot of people lose it all. They're, in fact, 99% of the people marketing on the Internet, online or offline, they're, they are not successful. And you're not going to be successful unless you study these basics. And so that's why I teach these at my seminars and in my books. But you can get, the good news is, you can get, not only in my books, I'll give you a few, I'll give you a few uh, authors that you can study. And you can use those books. 
And I used to give these authors without giving any of my books. And some of the people who come to my seminar and say, Ted, your books are better than these guys. They'd say this to me. Of course, they're flattering me. They'd say, your books are better. He said, why don't you mention any of your books? I said, listen, I'd be the last person to argue with you. So now I mention some of my books to Get Magic Words, which are on my website. Get Magic Words. Get Billion Dollar Marketing Secrets. Get How to Turn Words into Money. And you are going to have a library of great ideas of things that work. And then get, as I mentioned, Ogilvy is tremendous. Also, John Caples, he was the one that wrote the famous thing. You know, when I sat down at the piano and I started to play, he's the one that wrote that book, that classic ad. And he is, he's got a great book called Making Ads Pay. Making Ads Pay. Get a hold of that book. It's inexpensive. In other words, spend a few hundred dollars. on You're serious about making money. Spend a few hundred dollars on your education and listen Listen to all Jeremy's good, he's, he's interviewed some of the top marketers of the world. Listen to those interviews. I don't think it's going to break you. He's not charging $10,000 an interview or anything, charging a small amount, right? Thank you for that, yes. So listen to his interviews because these people are out doing it every day yeah. and you are aspire to do it. Now, I don't understand why, I mean, you know, all the time I was growing up, sort of growing up as a business man, I was studying if I could learn something from somebody in a $50 book or $100. Yeah, it's cheap. It's yeah. cheap. Isn't that better than getting my butt kicked in, which I had plenty of experience doing too, and being hard-headed about the whole thing and wanted to learn everything on my own without listening to anybody, don't do it. Because you have the chance now in this age that we live in where you, but most of the books written in the last 10 years, forget about them, no good. The best books written 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, the best books on marketing and copy, really tremendous books. And get, the, get all of those, Russ or Reeves, get those books because they'll teach you a lot more than the current contemporary book. Contemporary books, most of them are just theoretical or like some professor wrote, uh, you know, some professor got a couple of ideas and wrote it. And maybe it has one or two ideas. But if you're looking for a, an education in direct marketing, you've got to study the great. You've got to stand on the shoulders of the giants. You just can't you know, yeah, I've got a couple of good ideas. You've got to study them, man. Let me ask you this, Ted, and you bring up so many questions and I'm not going to have time to ask all of them, but, but two questions come up for me, which is I want to hear one of your favorite stories from Magic Words That Bring You Riches, and also I want to hear some of your favorite headlines of all time. Why, sure. Well, Magic Words That Bring You Riches, uh, I love one of the stories that's in there. It shows you exactly how to do it. I, I did a newsletter a few years ago talking about lawsuit protection, asset protection. And I was thinking, how could I create this newsletter and get a lot of money in the bank before I publish the newsletter? So what I did, I had this book on asset protection, was selling very well, and I simply wrote a letter that I enclosed in the book. So when people bought the book, they had the book, and then they have this sales letter inside the book. And what it says is, would you invest $97? This is the headline, roughly. It's not exact, but because the exact copies in the book, you know, I'll are, are give you a close proximity to it. Would you invest $97 to find the best newsletter published on the topic of asset protection? And that... The rest of that sales letter talked about talked about the virtues of the newsletter. Never was published yet. So I ran it for about six months. And on a given date, January 1st of that following year, I released the newsletter. And immediately I got $100,000 in advanced subscriptions. And you know what my marketing cost was? Zero. 
Now, I like that because the marketing cost was zero because I didn't even have postage because it just went in the book without any additional postage. So, that's so how do you put it in the book? Is it like just, an actual page or? No, it's like a four page letter right in the back of the book. So you get the, you get the book, you read the book, and on the back of the book is a sales letter about this newsletter where well, you just read this book which is all about the topic of the newsletter and so that's that, that to me i'm very proud of that because no one to my knowledge has ever done that it's really cool another story that i that i love to tell i had a guy his name is bill fisher came to me with a book a medical i published a lot of books that uh are like alternative medicine books. I love alternative medicine because that's what I use. I take a lot of vitamins and I do a lot of alternative things. It, it turns me on. I love that. In another life, I would have been a, a, a practitioner in the alternative medicine area. So he brings this book to me and it's a book about cancer. It's a book about warding off cancer or how do you, how do you treat cancer if you get it? So I read, I read the book, and in the book, much to my amazement, it, it describes this, this doctor in Germany called Dr. Joanna Budvig, and Budvig cereals in Europe are very popular, and this is what my wife and I are having two mornings a week. We're taking Budvig cereal, which is based on Dr. Joanna Budvig's book. Hmm. At that time, she was 96 years old wow. and seven time nominated for the Nobel Prize. Wow. So, so I read the book and on a page 117 of the book, I see that Dr. Budvig, who is quoted throughout the book, this cancer book, is... Uh, is featured in the book because she's the featured doctor in the book. Right. Bill Fisher is the author. She's the featured doctor. So I write the headline. The headline is how two natural foods can help you prevent and even cure cancer. And the subheadline is seven time Nobel because in copy, one of the things you've got to be very careful of something has to be not only true, yeah. it has to seem true. If if you make a statement like this will cure cancer, That's a, most, yeah. pe most people won't believe it. But I hasten to add seven-time Nobel nominee. Nobel nominees normally are believed. They're believed because they've been nominated for this world-famous award. So that's the headline, and that's the subheadline. And I... And I show the kind of the story of the book and all the development of the copy in magic words because I show the headline, the opening of the letter, and I retitle the book to How to Fight Cancer and Win. That's the title. Yeah. And I take another, this is a failed book now, failed book, didn't succeed, but I take this failed book and I take another fail book and I create five special reports to put on the order form. And so the book comes out and we, and we send 20,000 letters out, 20,000, got a huge response. And then we went to 50,000, 100,000, 250,000, 500,000. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen 500,000. 16 page letters, but it's like train loads <laughs> of like paper. A, yeah. Unbelievable. Fill your house. Yeah, it's like fills your house. And so we fill a warehouse full of these letters. In the meantime, the orders are pouring in. And my client, I only, there's only one way I lose clients, and that's when they retire. My client says, I'm going to retire, man. This is. I'm sending out so many letters, bringing so much money in. He retires. He retired. And I have another, I won't mention names, but I have another company that rips off my letter and they never pay me any royalties. Never pay me any royalties, which is a problem because I'm all the time having disputes with people who are taking my intellectual property and not paying me proper uh, royalties on it. 
So anyway, that's another story that I tell in the book, and I show every page of the copy, show the PS, show the order form, show the outer envelope. The outer envelope is critical, because if you've got a, an envelope that you're sending out to thousands of people, you've got to find a way to get people to open that envelope. And the envelope is so intriguing, so enticing that it opens. So that's another story that I yeah. show in more detail. The other things that I show in the book are, are ads on my book on incorporation, because as I mentioned, the incorporation ads is really what started me off and got me in a big, you might say the big time, you know, I started, well, I had to order 50,000 books at a time. I mean, I was selling so many books that that created my publishing company, really. As a, and as a matter of fact, I've got to admit that without that first big seller, I wouldn't have been as successful in selling other books because I already had them. I already had the audience. I had the mailing list from my first book. If the first book was a flop, I wouldn't have had the, the momentum to do that. So that was very, very important. Ted, I regret to say this. I know you only have a few more minutes, um, so I want to respect your time. Um, but I want you to tell people where can they find out. I have probably 50 more questions for you. I'm going to hold back on those. Um, but tell me, tell people where can they find out more? Where can they find your, your information? They can find, and I have a free, I have a free gift if, if you'd like me to mention it. It's great. Yeah, for sure. I've, I've read through it, and it's really good. Sure. Well, basically, you can look at all my work, or much of my work, most of my work, by looking at my website, www.tednicholas.com. And I have a special, I have a special offer for your audience. I have a special report called 87 Secrets of the Written Word. 87 Marketing Secrets of the Written Word. And you can get that absolutely free, no obligation. You don't ever have, you can just get the report and never again go to my website if that's what you want to do. Or you can get the report as a sample of my work and, and as an insight as to some of the things that I do. And you can go back to the website again and again. But basically, you just contact my website and Ask for 87 Marketing Secrets of the Written Word. And in there, I show many, many things that we've been talking about today. How to create headlines. How to create a winning PS. How to create an order form that's a killer. How to do a lot of subtle things so that people believe. See, if you ask me the number one reason people don't read copy is because they don't believe it. The copy... First of all, for copy to be believed, it has to be, it has to come from the heart. It has to be heartfelt. Most copy isn't even heartfelt by the copywriter, let alone the reader of the copy. I don't write anything unless I feel the, the emotions that I'm writing about. And your copy has to be emotional or it won't sell. So I talk about how to create the emotional intensity that you need to be successful in the report. I get the report. It's many, many pages. It's something like 22 pages. And uh, you can get it right away. And you can get it instantly because it can be sent right to your computer. Yep. TedNicholas.com. Uh, it's T-D-N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S.com. Ted, I have one last question for you. And I'm going to openly challenge you to a tennis match if we're ever in the same city and you ever have the time. Um, my last question is, what should the headline be for this interview when I post it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the headline should be something like the most valuable marketing secrets ever discussed in an interview involving Dr. Jeremy, what, how do you speak? Weiss. Uh, Weiss. Yeah. Dr. Jeremy Weiss and Ted Nicholas. All right. Thank you, Ted. I appreciate it. It's an honor and a pleasure. 
and everyone check out his website. I have it. There's like hordes of valuable stuff on there. Thank you again. You're welcome, Jeremy. It was a pleasure talking with you. You have very good questions. And thanks for all the preparation you did for this interview. You're very welcome. Thank you. Challenge for a tennis match. All right. There but, you... but the winner, the winner, what does the winner get? <laughs> I'll let you decide. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ted. <laughs>